Okay. Uh, we should get started. So thank you all for your interest in the spice bath, a full room, so we like that. Um, Bam and I are the bath chairs. Bam is uh, working from remote joining us. Um, and I have Roman uh, next to me to help me sort of sort of get everything organized here and, and uh, keep track of the discussion. So we have three scribes, uh, Thomas, Kalia, and Christina. Thank you for doing that. OK. Pretty full agenda, uh, but first a few housekeeping notes. You've seen those slides already from uh, like yesterday. <laughs> and also for those who attended the hackathon, uh, you've seen it on Saturday and Sunday as well. Uh, the note well statement, so the our process is well documented. There are a bunch of um, published RFCs that describe like the process, the working groups, uh, like patents and participation and so on. In a nutshell, um, since you've seen this already before, uh, be civilized in discussions. Appreciate that other participants have different views. Uh, you don't need to agree with them, uh, but be friendly to each other. That's what this, uh, the note will say, and, and of course there's uh, more important documents regarding copyright and patents and so on. So the meeting is recorded. Uh, you're familiar with the tools. Uh, please scan the QR code when you join the queue and so we can actually see your name and have uh, your participation recorded as well. Here are a few resources you should know, like the agenda and everything. Let's jump over that really quick. This is the agenda. I've, we've sent it out on the list. Um, it's pretty compressed. Since many of you may not have been following the detailed discussions on the mailing list that happened over the last uh, like six months or so in various different uh, shapes and forms, we want to go through some of the background material really quick. And we found some excellent speakers uh, to give you that overview. So please hold your questions uh, till we have then the clarifying question slot, if you have some clarifying questions, or later if they actually concern the charter and the milestones and, and if you have other, uh, other concerns or other questions. So we have allocated the a lot of time for the discussion, but we need to get through the, the background material first. Uh, so just be patient there. So a lot of content, uh, and if you are new to this, this field, that, that may be uh, quite informative for you. Okay, uh, I don't want to speak uh, too long here, but instead want to switch uh, straight to the presenters. And the first one is Leif. Uh, No. No, of course. Yeah. That, uh, just. Yeah, that, that motor had the configuration. Uh, all right. Hi, Leif Johansson. Um, so I'm here to give you um, what was called the market driver. And I'm actually not going to talk about any market, but rather the European Union legislative <laughs> process. Um, so this is, you know, the expression, the two things you don't want to see how they're made, laws and sausages. So this is the, you know, hold on to your, bar, your barf bags uh, section of the ITF. Um, the um, European Union's attempt to build a, a digital identity wallet has kind of a, a couple of, actually four work strands. Um, and for somebody with a U.S. background, right, one of the key things to understand about the EU is that the EU is not re it's not actually a political process as much as a deal making negotiation process and so what this is basically is a 30 way 
negotiation between all of the member states and the European Commission around sort of how do we actually make something that we could use as a digital identity wallet. Um, I'm involved in something called the Large Scale Pilots, which is an attempt to actually look at use cases. Um, and there is a legislative process that is designed to produce something called implementation acts. Now, um, the TLDR version here is that implementation acts are technical uh, specifications masquerading as law or law masquerading as technical specifications. In the EU, um, stuff that goes into implementation acts have to be based on standards published by either ISO or Etsy. That's, that's the law. Doesn't mean that ISO and Etsy have to write all of the specs. And that's kind of why I'm here to talk about why SPICE is, is in my uh, opinion, needed, right? Um, we can skip to the next slide. Um, so the thing we're trying to accomplish in the EUDI process, and um, ideally over the next three to two to three years, is something called implementation acts that uh, references um, standards produced elsewhere, hopefully. Uh, actual technical and semantic interoperability between the between 30 member states um, and some operational use cases. Now, the interesting bits here is that like, initially it was thought that in-person uh, third-party flows, things like presenting your driver's license to a police officer, a digital driver's license on your phone to a police officer physically, maybe at um, a a DUI check. That would be like one of the major drivers for this. It turns out that the member states actually want to look at web-based um, use cases, which means that there is a there are kind of two work strands going on. One where there's a lot of focus on the in-person flows, and one where there's a lot of focus on the web flows. And the the web flows. Um, we're looking at the, the standards we actually want to use there are things uh, that you probably have all heard of, things like OpenID for VCI and OpenID for VP. But there, is a, there are some gaps there, uh, especially around uh, what the credentials look like, what their security and privacy properties are, et cetera, et cetera. And also, you know, it wouldn't hurt if the EU came out of this with something that approached global interoperability, right? We're, we could actually talk to the rest of the world. Um, next slide. So um, the, the ask if there is such a thing from us on this side of the Atlantic to the, yeah, the ITF community is that we would really like to have foundational standards uh, ready sooner rather than later um, for web flow credentials that ensure interoperability with OIDC um, for verifiable credentials. Um, and maybe the, the need that we can see in the uh, EUDI wallet process is that there are issues around credential security and privacy that need to be worked out. And that's where the like the main, at, at least if you ask us, that's where the main focus of this work should be. Uh, there is certainly no time to duplicate any work uh, going on in other standards organizations like the OpenID Foundation. Um, we have like full confidence that that is getting done. Um, but we need stuff that Etsy can reference, so that Etsy doesn't have to go and rewrite stuff, basically. That's the that's the fun, that's the ask um, that that I'm, I'm trying to convey, and I think that's what I had. Um, there are like several um, tens of millions of users who are looking to to this um, in the next couple of years to actually get actual use cases deployed at scale. Um, so this is not a pilot in the sense that it's a it's an ec a theoretical exercise. It actually touches real users. Um, all right. I don't know. Are we taking yep. questions or no? We, uh, right. Not that. That was the thing later. Um, right. Yeah. Thanks, Leif. Uh, yeah, it's great. 
this is one example, one um, sort of part of the world. Of course, other governments are also looking into using digital uh, credentials, and that's uh, since we worked on that space, good thing. Brent. Uh, Brent Sundell. Uh, some of the use cases that we want this work to support or this working group to support um, are listed on the slide. They all follow a similar pattern. The worker is providing an assertion from A1 forklifts about their forklift certification to a construction company. Um, for each of these, there is an unspoken, you know, so that, so that this person can work. Um, the so that is, in my opinion, outside the scope of what we want this work to, this work group to do. Um, what we need is the technology to do it. Um, each of these assertions uh, is provided to uh, an individual or a company or some entity and then shared with any number of other entities uh, signed and secured and ideally privacy preserving. Uh, next slide, please. So each of these follows a very similar pattern. Some holder is providing an assertion from, a, uh, from an issuer about some subject to a verifier. Uh, sometimes this flow is called the three-party model, um, but it's slightly different from, from other flows that have been designed and developed elsewhere in that there is this third party, there's this holder that serves kind of as a cache for the information about the subject that's been issued by the issuer. These assertions are, we call them credentials. When the assertion is shown to a verifier, that's called a presentation. Um, and these presentations and credentials, they get evaluated according to policies, both on the holder side, the issuer side, and most importantly, the verifier side. Next slide, please. Um, the reason that we need a working group at IETF to continue work that has been done on these things is because we need better technology that is more secure and more private. Uh, we, we need this so that the decision-making process, both on the holder side and the verifier side can be automated so that this will have reduced processing time, better throughput and better efficiencies overall, uh, particularly in the remote use cases uh, when there are internet flows involved. Next slide, please. <laughs> So this slide is an example of some technologies that are somewhat associated with these ideas. Uh, the ones at the top were all developed uh, at ITF. And as you can see, this is kind of a rough timeline. There are uh, attribute certs way back in 2010 were worked on that touch on this. JSON web tokens are kind of a piece that applies somewhat to this. Um, I do want to note there are a lot of things in progress that are not on this slide. Um, what was accomplished at the W3C and the Verifiable Credentials Working Group, something I'm personally very proud of, is the great marketing of this, these concepts. The three-party model was coined there, even though it was obviously you know, in use other places and enabled other places. Um, and so what we want to do in the IETF in particular is take these ideas, build upon them, and make sure that they are as secure and private as they ought to be. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, good, I'm done. Thanks, Brent. Um, so just talking to some potential work items and this particular item is my first time presenting. So let's see if it makes sense to people. Um, so one of the reasons I think there's an ask for a new working group is because this model that Brent just very well described is not exactly what OWASP working group is right now chartered to do. The conversation of rechartering there, but I'm just going to leave this slide here. Well, the point I was trying to emphasize here is 
the whole street party model really heavily relies on asymmetric um, cryptography. So there are potentially three key pairs that are being involved. So left-hand side is issuance, right-hand side is presentation that usually happens asynchronously. And on the left-hand side, sorry, I should have put um, numbers, but essentially the bottom wallet providing control over the um, public key A, that's kind of the first step. Um, the user has to prove control of a certain key. I call it key pair A. And then issuer, after it verifies, signs over that key. That's what I denoted as you know, key pair B. And the wallet gets a credential, the piece of data that the user claims, right? And on the right-hand side, um, we have, so again, I'm sorry for other button errors, but essentially the bottom error is the, the first one. Um, the verifier sends a request, which is usually signed um, as a way to identify the verifier and to authenticate the verifier. That's why it's denoted as a, a key per C. Um, and the wallet uses the um, key pair A that it proved control to the issuer to sign over, and that kind of allows this detached model. So the, the fundamental is in kind of trust in the this user controlling the keys during presentation that it controlled during issuance too. And also one important note, um, the use cases are not only for the natural pe people. Um, there are large scale use cases emerging for legal persons. Um, again, EU is driving force here. And also um, machine identity, like self big supply chains. Um, and while we're talking about this, so if we can go to the next slide, how do we find this key pairs is the question, right? So for the issuers, and verifiers key pair, like those are usually big organization, not big, but it's like legal person, right? So we can use good old X5 or nine, dot well known endpoint. So there are some options to use decentralized identifiers on um, maybe something else. For the users, it's a bit harder because we don't really, I guess, expect um, every single user to have an X5 or nine or every single user having a resolvable endpoint that each user hosts. So usually the options are for natural persons, right? Um, options are using real public key, um, JWK thumbprint URI that's an RFC on it. Again, decentralized identifiers, maybe something else. And going to the next slide, while we're talking about this, is there kind of pros and cons of this existing approaches? So starting with um, X509, obviously well-established BKI, scales well, there's software um, that people know how to use. Um, in some use cases, for example, and you know, I'm counting on people who have more expertise on this than me do, but in supply chain, for example, use cases, so there are some use cases that require the history of the keys, um, meaning we want to follow like which key was used when, so it kind of guarantees this longevity of me, can I can I can I verify this attestation um, in ten years? Um, the well known endpoint arguably simpler than X5 or 9, um, and can be modular. The same domain could be resolved using different well known paths to get the keys per purpose. And it's fascinating, maybe it's not fascinating, but like there's actually, it does not, there's no well known paths that exists for a key discovery for this three party model, specifically for this purpose yet. There's first attempt in one of the drafts in ITF it's called um, SD JOT, Select Disclosure for JOT, for Public Credential Draft, and OWASP Working Group. That one defines a pass the well known slash JOT issuer um, specifically for that purpose. Um, so that's kind of one example, but it's not published yet, right? Decentralized identifiers, it's a standard in W3C. Um, I think arguably one of the benefits it brings is the indirection between the document that contains the keys and the actual kind of identifier you can use for the entity uh, that controls that key. And the document um, can obtain not just the keys, but you know different endpoints that can store other credentials, whatnot. Cons, it mandates linked data, RDF world, I think we want something simpler. And many of us want something simpler, like only JSON. They're kind of no of the show intro because maybe you've heard about the ID methods, but there's possibility to host these key documents on, on blockchain, not using blockchain on the web, not having them at all. So you have to, you can't have interoperability, it's just not all the shelf. And I think 
there's hesitation from implementers because there's some associations with it. If you go to the next slide, just a few quick examples to, if you can go to the next slide, a few examples. Um, so top is issue identifier in COSI header. Second one is the HOSI header. If you go to the next slide, if you append, for example, dot well known, I'm um, issuer or whatever endpoint, oh, sorry. If you append dot well known jot issuer, you get it as a GWK directly or GWK URI where we can get the keys. That's kind of the idea behind dot well known in particular. Um, next slide. So I guess a few questions. Um, yeah, if there's a, so I think a few requirements are, a document with key pair information containing key rotation history, the so JSON, um, interoperable to shelf, um, reputation of ITF. I think some of us wanted to kind of work with X549 as too. And I'm not saying these are SAR requirements. I think we should start from requirements too, probably. That just, you know, what I collected. Um, so I think the question is this notation of how do you get the keys, how do you identify and how do you trust um, the entity based on that needs to be documented um, well. So where to document it and where to do this work of, you know, if anything new needs to be defined, which I think it might be useful, um, where that work can happen. Good. Thank you. Ori, you are going right. to talk about selective disclosure. <clears throat> Hello. Um, so I'm uh, I'm Ori Steele, um, and I work on uh, decentralized identifiers at W3C, verifiable credentials at W3C. I work on uh, securing software supply chain integrity and transparency, IETF. A bunch of work um, on both HOSI and COSI standards. And uh, to be honest, Christina could have given this part of the presentation as well because. Uh, a lot of this selective disclosure um, sort of framing and discussion that I'm about to talk about uh, was work that she's been doing along with other contributors within the OAuth working group. Um, one other sort of comment, just a little background that I would give is, as Leif mentioned, there are sort of many different use cases for these technologies, not just for you know natural uh, you know persons doing in-person physical presentation, but also for organizations exchanging business documents to facilitate trade deals, global commerce, et cetera. And that's actually my interest in this area is in the context of securing uh, phys cyber physical supply chains, international trade relations, issues with customs and imports. And in those documents, uh, the data structures associated with the assertions can very quickly become large. So one of the things that I'm very interested in is uh, concise representations of some of the same structures we've seen evolving within the OAuth working group. Um, so one of those is selective disclosure within uh, CBOR, but it follows some of the structures that we've seen for selective disclosure in JSON. With that background, I'm going to kind of describe a high level uh, flow. Um, and so now that you know this issuer, holder, and verifier roles, let's say you have an issuer has some claims about a subject perhaps the subject's name and their date of birth. This first arrow is issuance. The subject receives a credential that contains their subject identifier, their name, their date of birth. Could be their name and their date of birth. Could be their child's name, their child's date of birth. The holder is not always the subject of the credential. At some point, the holder is gonna make a presentation to a verifier. In the interest of uh, respecting data minimization, the data controller would like to present only the claims that are necessary for the verifier to perform its business function, its operation. Communicating extra information will uh, open the verifier up to holding information that it doesn't need to perform its purpose. It loses control of that information. Or if there's a breach, that's all extra liability that verifier doesn't want. And of course, as a data subject and possibly a data controller, I don't want to give out information about myself if it's not in support of some activity that's of benefit to me. So one of the valuable features of selective disclosure is revealing with integrity protection, one assertion and not revealing others. So here you can see the name has been redacted, but the date of birth is still presented. Next slide. 
Um, as I said before, the main property that we're looking for here is integrity protection over the data, but with the ability to support data minimization. The traditional signature schemes, you usually have to reveal the entire content of the payload that was secured. With selective disclosure, you can reveal parts of the payload that have been secured and still prove that they have not been tampered with since the issuer committed to those values. Um, and as I said, it can prevent this process of oversharing. And with this building block, we can build better experience, safer experiences into these digital credential flows. I think it's a really, really important part of enabling this, uh, these properties that Brent mentioned at the beginning. If we go at this problem without thinking about data minimization, about privacy and confidentiality, and about the needs of businesses, in addition to the needs of individuals, um, we have a, a, a potential to make um, the world to decrease the security and privacy uh, mission that we're trying to solve if we don't enable selective disclosure from the beginning. And there's other properties, linkability, unlinkability is another one that, you know, we have to think about these things from the beginning of designing this because uh, it's an important part of maintaining the security properties. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, sort of similar to uh, the slide that Christina was giving, uh, comparing some of these identifier schemes, I, I want to just describe some of the benefits of doing selective disclosure in COSI as opposed to selective disclosure in HOSI. So, you know, one of the benefits of working in COSI is uh, binary um, doesn't have to be text encoded. So we can get these really compact document formats and that's a, a, a benefit, especially when you have nested structures where you have uh, binary identifiers and you know, you're, you're keeping your document size smaller. Um, one of the benefits I think that, and this personal opinion on COSI, one of the things I really like about it is that it has a familiar, familiar familiarity to the HOSI development experience. So I, I learned web development, I used HOSI, I built OAuth systems, and then later, as I wanted some of these compact, concise properties, I started to use, use Cozy for things. And that transition was easy for me as a developer because of some of the familiarity. There's other places where it, there wasn't a direct analogy or um, maybe Cozy had invented something that Cozy didn't have. But this, this synergy and alignment between Cozy and Cozy is a property that I believe is very valuable and it's part of why I contribute to both working groups at the IETF. Um, some of the challenges around COSI though, to just be aware, if you're trying to apply CBOR and COSI to digital credential formats, the tooling and maturity ecosystem can be a little bit difficult to, to get started with. I'd highly recommend if you're interested in this, you focus on diagnostic notation um, and CDDL, learn the, the basic visual tools that will shorten your iteration and learning process as you adopt them. Um, there are some strange deviations between COSI and HOSI. You should you know, be aware of those as you design secure systems. Um, and then there's uh, issues with determinism or uh, binary support in different languages. So you know, potentially you're gonna be working in a language that doesn't have great binary support, although maybe don't use that language. <laughs> uh, next slide. So I wanted to give you a kind of visual uh, understanding of this selective disclosure structure and this SD CWT proposal mirrors the SD JWT proposal which is a adopted work item within the OAuth working group and it's been progressing fabulously there. Um, so the structure that you're going to see here is kind of a cozy take on that same approach um, and there's some challenges that Hosey has in communicating these disclosures that Cozy doesn't have because Cozy has this unprotected header that's built into the fundamental data structure. So here in this envelope format, you see the protected header, it's blue. The unprotected header, it's this red box, the payload with disclosable values and the signature. And as you can see, the, the disclosable values in the payload and the disclosed value in the unprotected header, the coloring there is to make your brain think about switching them. And that's exactly how selective disclosure in these structures works. So I could remove values from the unprotected header to redact them from the disclosure, or I could add them back to the unprotected header to include them in a presentation. 
And that simple process of sort of adding or removing things uh, it can be integrity protected. Um, and it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty simple to implement. I've implemented it for SDJOT and I implemented a SDCWT implementation as well. I'm not, are we taking questions now or? No. Okay. Rowan is just queuing for a little later, right? I just no, 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 no. We have a separate slot. Ro Ro it, wait a little it's bit. It's not a question. It was just a suggestion to give a little bit more example here for most of the room. More example? Sure. Um, so uh, let's say you're presenting a, um, a document that is in a supply chain context and it's related to an upstream or downstream supplier. And as part of this business negotiation, you have a document from one of your uh, vendors that you want to present, but there's sensitive business information in that document that you don't want to disclose. Uh, with selective disclosure, um, you will be able to redact that information. And actually, there's an example coming up next that's supply chain software specific. Hopefully, it'll be good. Next slide. Indeed. <laughs> Glad I remember my slides. Um, so I mentioned that I work um, on the, it, within the Skit working group on securing software supply chains. And uh, one of the critical uh, data structures that we look at in, in that context is the Software Bill of Materials, or SBOM. You've, you probably have heard of the word SBOM recently because it's been all over the news. The SBOM is the thing that's gonna tell you what went into the software that you're working on. And if one of those components has a problem in it, how do you identify where all, all the places that I might need to go to fix that problem? So a uh, software bill of materials is kind of a manifest of all of the dependencies that went into a software product. And it could get very, very large. Um, I don't know, you know what your software development experience is, but uh, as you can tell, I'm a JavaScript developer and I'm, you know, I'm a JavaScript developer. Our package <laughs> ecosystem, our package ecosystem is, is a bit of a problem. And it's not just JavaScript. Uh, Almost all major programming languages that have a lot of adoption will have lots of different software packages that you can choose from. And as a developer, you'll quickly reach for them to build out a solution. But every one of them is a potential vulnerability, a threat, an unknown CVE. And you could build that artifact and deploy it and then three seconds later be notified, but it's already out the door. How do you communicate? to your, your, your customers, your, your upstream or downstream software supply chain parties, what's going on with the, the software product that you've just made based on the latest information that you have. So the software bill of materials is basically, as I said, it's a manifest. And so within that manifest, I might reveal certain parts of the data structure. On the left-hand side, you can see an overall envelope as a cozy sign one with a protected header at the top and uh, the rest of the envelope underneath. And you can see that there's disclosures in the unprotected header. So this is the concrete example from the previous slide. And then in the payload, you can see that the payload is this sort of JSON looking data structure, but it has these places where there's a disclosable value that could be substituted in. Next slide. Oh. So there was emojis in here and uh, they were beautifully colored and they've been, go back. Sorry. Uh, the colors are gone. So it's gonna be very hard for me to communicate where the substitutions happened, um, but I'm still gonna try. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the payload and on the right-hand side, you can see the disclosures. In the payload, where you see the 222, that is a place where the disclosure will go. Um, and so there's two places you can see that in the payload, and then there's two disclosures on the right-hand side. And the disclosures have this salt piece, they have the disclosed value, and then they have the, the um, well, actually they just have the salt and disclosed value. Those pieces pop into where you see the 222 and that's what allows me to reveal that I had a shell script in the directory when I ran this, and that's important security information for the software build materials. What happens if the hash on that shell script changes? Is that okay? Maybe, right? So this is what software builds of materials are supposed to help us with, to look at 
whether our software artifacts have been tampered with to see the ingredients that went into producing them. And when combined with selective disclosure, I could reveal to you with integrity protection that these files were in this directory and their hashes were these values. But I can omit other information about which files may have been adjacent to them that are maybe not relevant to you. Now, that's degrading some of the transparency property, but that could be an important part of complying with the legal processes that my business has. Or for other reasons, I might choose not to disclose the full software bill of materials. This is just one use case. Next slide. That's it. Thank you, Ori. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Mike Jones. I was asked to talk with you about privacy. And before we even go to the next slide, I will illustrate um, by example, kind of the opposite of privacy. We could build identity systems where anybody who asked for any information about you got all the possible claims about you uh, with no access control. Uh, that would enable them to do whatever their mission was, but that's probably not for privacy reasons how we want to build systems that disclose information about us. So some of the motivation for this work is to do better than that. Next. So there's lots of possible privacy aspects. Uh, I'll go over some of my favorites. Uh, this is by no means probably a comprehensive treatment of the subject. And I thought I would be able to take questions in line. We'll take the questions afterwards. If you think I you know, omitted something incredibly important or I just have a wrong view, that's okay. Next. So one privacy property is minimal disclosure only releasing the information that you need for an interaction, rather than per my counterexample, just releasing everything to everybody. This can be accomplished in a number of different ways. Uh, using OpenID Connect, you can have the relying party use the claims request and request tokens with only the claims that you need. Or in the three-party model, a verifier can ask the wallet for a presentation with only the needed claims and the wallet issues it. Both of these are forms of selective disclosure. Uh, this is enabled in this case by OpenID Connect claims request parameter by SDJots, by ISO mobile driver's licenses, and by other things that you've already heard about. Next. There's a property that I like to call not calling home. Um, I can use my Washington driver's license, the plastic embossed thing with some security features to board an airplane for a domestic flight in the United States. I can use it as proof of age to purchase alcohol. And the Washington Department of Licensing doesn't know that I did either of those things. Uh, it, the use is not calling home to the issuer. So in the online world, um, OpenID Connect and SAML, for instance, do call home. Um, if a SAML SP requests a token with claims about you or assertions in the SAML world, you do go to the IDP, you get the claims. So the IDP knows that you asked for them and where you're gonna use them. Where VCs in the third party, in the three party model, don't call home. Uh, credentials can be held by the wallet or holder and reused indefinitely. Others are single use, but you can mitigate that by uh, multiple issuance. And I will note that, well, the wallet can still see where you use these VCs, but not the issuer. Next. Non-correlation among verifiers. This uh, is the notion that verifiers can't talk to each other and figure out that 
the two sets of claims they got were both about the same person or indeed from the same verifiable credential. That's a noble cause. I will note that for that to work, the information in each presentation has to be distinct. So if, for instance, Ori's nodding, if um, you included constant claims like your email address or your name, uh, all sense of non-correlatability, all bets are off. Um, so take that as you will. But non-correlation is technically enabled by things like BBS signatures on presentations. There's work in the CFRG here on that. There's work in the Jose Working Group on uh, JWP and single-use credentials. So we are working on enabling this using standards. Next. There's not just one kind of non-correlation. You can think about preventing correlation among many different kinds of parties. I know there's been some discussions on some of the mailing lists about trying to, for instance, prevent correlation among issuers and verifiers, such that even the issuer can't tell that the presentation that you received corresponds to a verifiable credential that it issued. That's probably technically possible. It's not clear whether that's needed or important. Um, and it's, I don't think we have protocols for doing that, but I wanted to give you, you know, a bigger sense of the possible space of privacy. Next. Tracking. I've already talked about this a little bit. Um, it's the ability for a party to observe and record your actions. So OpenID Connect providers can track which RPs you use and what claims you release to them. SAML can do this too. In the three-party model, wallets can track which issuers and verifiers you use. On the World Wide Web, the browsers that you use can track which websites you use. And some of this may be inevitable just to build these technical systems that we rely on for our everyday life. It's what the trackers do with that information that affects your privacy. Next. One possibility is rather than releasing data about you as full claims, so for instance, uh, my twin daughter's birth date is on this slide. Um, it is possible not only to release their birth date, but there are systems where you could instead release a proof that their birth date is over the age of 18 um, without revealing their birth date in 1994. Um, and this is indeed enabled by technologies called zero knowledge proofs. Again, some of the CFRG and BBS work is enabling this. Next. Um, with that, I'll stop. I've tried to put a few thoughts in your head. I think I was even asked to talk about this because all of this is motivating some of the work we're considering here today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh... So this is, uh, so we've run through this really quickly and I think time-wise we are uh, doing very, very well. Uh, are there any clarifying questions on this, on this topic? Otherwise I would move on to the chart uh, milestone discussion. So I know this was very, very brief. Um, it's obviously a, a broad topic. You've seen many of the documents referenced and uh, there's a lot of ongoing work in, in various groups from OWAS to COSI and HOSI and CFRG and who knows what um, other organizations. So um, this is sort of like the super condensed version of it. Manu, you have sort of few, Manu, you have a clarifying question. Go for it. Well, uh, can this be a comment also? 
Uh, oh, is there a, sec a section? There's a separate. Later? There's a separate section of. I will lower my hand. Okay. My next, yeah. Um, my question is for Leaf, um, and um, I wanted to understand to the extent that um, he cares about um, uh, personal presentations from smartphones versus Ori is more focused on business documents from place to place. Uh, so I'd like to know the extent to which this is important or not. And, and by this, you, you mean like in person? Smartphone. Smartphone. So, I mean, smart, using smartphones and use, using uh, the, you know, various app ecosystems is going to be important, whether you do, like, whether it's me showing you some credential in person like this, like literally in person, or whether it's me talking to some service that talks to you, right? So, so actually, that's a good point. So there's two two clear questions. One is yes, the person to person where we're actually adjacent, but the other side is where there's an expectation that uh, my credentials will be in a trusted execution environment, which reasonably I only that's only going to work in my smartphone in a uh, reasonable way across people, right? I, I don't think that's necessarily an assumption. Uh, I think there are there, there are many ways to build uh, third-party uh, ecosystems. Um, some of them like rely on FIDO tokens, for instance, as a secure element. So I don't think it's necessarily dependent on the smartphone ecosystem. I think this can actually be something that you build for the web, and, and we've sort of been playing around with that in some of our pilots. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but no, I don't think it's tied to the smartphone ecosystem. Roman. Hi, Roman Danilio, as an, as an individual. I think this is a question for Ori based on the presentations. Uh, so I observe that many times when we do something in JSON, we want to do it in Seaboard. There's this uh, cross-pollination between the JWT and the CWT community. I saw one of the markers you had out there is that things are different in Seaboard. Uh, and as we talk about the ongoing work we have with selective disclosure in the in a JSON kind of encoding, why is that more complicated in a Seaboard encoding? And why couldn't we just have a common CDDL that generates both? Hi, Ori Steele. I'm so glad you asked that question. It's my favorite <laughs> question. Um, so in, in JSON, we have this uh, need to sort of harden the data structure before we provide cryptography around it. We use base64 URL encoding. We use JSON serialization. Um, the Unicode encoding details matter in, in those worlds. And so when you create a selective disclosure scheme with the constraints of building on top of JSON web tokens or JSON web signatures, you encounter the limits of the media type expressions we've used for them historically. So if you're familiar with a JSON web token, typically there's three components, the protected header, the payload, and the digital signature. Where do you put the disclosures? So in SDJOT, there's sort of two answers to that question that are JSON and Jose specific. Um, one place is to append them to this string with tilde characters, it's the last remaining control character we have. Um, another place would be to use the JSON serialization and to put them in the unprotected header sort of block that's only available to the JSON serialization. And that mirrors the cozy structure, um, but it's not available in all of the places you might want it to be. So while Jose and Cozy are typically very strongly aligned, there are these cases where one has uh, features that the other one doesn't and you really wish it did and sometimes the opposite of that and so it can be important to when you're trying to maintain architecture alignment so that you can have uh, upgradability um, preserving the same security and privacy properties as you give uh, you know smaller payloads energy saving less storage to your users it, it, it's helpful to have that architectural alignment while still having uh, the same capabilities in both places i hope that answers the question <laughs> okay, cool. Um, Hank, so the next part, um, and that's where the discussion part starts, is to 
talk about the charter, the milestones, specifically, obviously, the milestones indicate like what documents does the group, the proposed group want to produce. And there's uh, on the link below, uh, this is sort of the current snapshot of the, the charter text that was circulated around on the mailing list, on the SPICE mailing list. Um, you can see the full version. We don't throw them up on the screen because it's, uh, it's too much. But Hank, go for it. Yeah, hi, I'm Hank. Uh, for convenience purposes, I posted the link that you just saw into the chat. So it's, you don't have to remember that. Um, yeah, so uh, what to say? Um, the charter discussion is the, one of the main parts of the Birds of a Feather working group forming activity, and we have one. So we wrote one up. We already got extensive feedback from Roman. Thank you for that. It took some time. You have more. <laughs> you have more. <laughs> Always. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, I was going around, and we have an uh, expert of identity here in the group, Kalia. And uh, uh, so I was asking her, what's this about? And uh, I think that's the quote. I will, I will, this is the only thing I will read out loud here from a slide deck because it's awful to do that. We are creating a venue for individuals who really want to work on verifiable credential stuff at IDF. That's it. That is the main purpose. And let's go to the details now. So what else? <laughs> yes. There's, there's some items that we have heard today about that's a verifiable credentials. I think that's pretty uh, uh, well known. The selective disclosure and the uh, non-correlation part that is called sometimes unlinkability. These are features that will be manifest here. I think we heard from Ori uh, the benefits of the CBOR representation. Sometimes there's work ongoing then we have to align this work and there are different experts about this work and um and and, and attracting them i think that is again the people have to come here I, I can't even better repeat that so we will look out at the text so the alignment of the uh, json and the CBO representations uh in a way that makes sense so it's not um, we have to take into account the tiny differences, sometimes the fixes CWT provides and sometimes the coolness that the JWT is so adopted and, and combine them here. And um, as we uh, as I said, I think in the, world, in the beginning, uh, Leaf said, uh, it would be really beneficial for this uh, to be not be usable just in a certain scope, but worldwide. And the industry really is kind of like uh, breathing down our neck here at some point. So um, I think the most important part that hasn't been discussed yet or hasn't been said yet in the charter is uh, that the protocol that, that kind of create those micro-credentials, that create the statement that you are just uh, older than 18 and then okay to drive a car or to cross that water or whatever, uh, these protocols to transform that are out of scope at the moment. What we ideally wish to have is um, the protocols would be like independent of the uh, representation of those statements that we create here. I think that might be to some extent wishful thinking, but I think it's a, it's, it's a achievable goal when we define that well. And that is what the charter is about. So next items in the charter mm -hmm. is the milestones. And they're pretty obvious, I think. They're just repeating what everybody just said. So we will have a binding document that explains the whole setup. There were a lot of um, diagrams here, right? Explaining how, how linkability works, which, which roles are there. Maybe there's a fourth role in the internet. We heard about mediators. Sometimes people do not want mediators. They're not applicable to every situation. Maybe that is something to discuss in working items that become then the architect document. Um, the SD items and the unlinkability items, I think, are. Uh, undisputable, they are, they are immediate demands uh, of the industry right now. And I think uh, the demarcation line here is that we have the JOTs and the COTS, and we do not have to rely on JSON-LD and all the semantics we would inherit on that. We can learn a lot from that, but we do not have to use them here. I want to say that. And then there is the idea that the identity documents uh, that we create become their own thing. Uh, so that is something to be bashed. That is the chartering process because we already had a charter. There's this thing again, and there are these milestones at the end of it. And um, I just 
think I'm giving the overview for that discussion because I'm not uh, leading the discussion. I think uh, you are. But um, I think uh, one parting comment is that as um, always go where the experts are. And this room has like 177 attendees, my, my mate Echo tells me. And I'm very hopeful. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Hank, and thanks to all the presenters for sort of keeping our aggressive timeline in mind. So now we've come to the place where the direct presentation or the, the lecturing is over. Uh, now we switch into the discussion mode. And uh, yeah, we are already there. Uh, Dimitri, is, I see the first one. Thanks, uh, Dimitri Zagadul and MIT Digital Credentials Consortium. So I have two important questions. One is, who came up with the SPICE acronym? That's good job. <laughs> Ori. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nicely done, Ori. <laughs> nicely done, okay. Uh, and then uh, second question is for Hank. So you mentioned um, the open world extensibility. Can, can you say a little more about what you meant by that? Thanks. <clears throat> So this is Hank trying to answer a question. Um, yeah, so um, there, there are, uh, okay, when, when I'm, I'm talking like, a, like a, a syntax guy, there are extension points, and these extension points enable you to do other things. <laughs> what, what, what other things are there? Um, I think uh, Leaf had one example, that's the um, digital driver license. But uh, we had a recent problem meeting uh, for a few years, and there were these QR codes, and, and they're kind of the same thing. And we have like uh, uh, items that are records when I have done something wrong and I've gone to uh, somewhere that is uh, not a free space anymore and bars and cans I can rattle at. And then, and then this should be gone after two years. Uh, some countries require that this, this disclosure is gone. So there's a tons of applicability uh, here in a global standard. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting for international interactivity. So when I go to an airport, and, and there's, of, of course, often this is passport uh, analogy that my, my country gives me this passport, and I'm, I'm going somewhere, and I'm presenting it to the immigration desk, and, and what does the immigration desk really want? So I am, I'm a trusted traveler. I basically, they know everything about me, but that's my decision of disclosure. If I'm not that guy, and I'm giving them my passport, I want to enter my country without any bias. I know that's an ideal world. I know that's a, that's a, uh, that, 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 that some of these things might not be achievable yet. But, but, but I think the global applicability here is that all of these items could be achieved with subsets of the solutions that are provided in these milestones. And that's, I think, the global applicability. Does that make sense? I'll talk about digital passports when I get up there. Yeah, you you do that. How about extensibility, though? Um, so again? Uh, how is that extensibility, though? Um, so, excuse me, I just want to jump in. The, the point is, please don't yell from the room. If you have a comment to make, please come up to the mic. Remote participants yeah. cannot hear you, and certainly even, even other folks in the I, room can't hear you. Sorry for Thanks. making the mistake, but, I, but the question in the room was, how is that extensibility? And that was from my previous uh, uh, Q uh, map partner here. Um, the extensibility here is that you need more characteristics sometimes uh, in sake of claims in, in, in the form of what a unprotected header um, uh, algorithm you require to, to put it, to, un to undisclose it or disclose it. So there are m multiple ways to do that. So that is something that you have to extend. Um, then there's regulation of cryptography, apparently. So you can't go somewhere and disclose somewhere with an algorithm that you are not allowed to use. And, and so there's the, I'm just making this, this is just from the top of my head. So, so there are extensibility points here that would enable the global use that. Okay. Uh, thank, thanks for the comment. Uh, Jonathan. So I just had a quick read of the charter and it mentions, oh, you know, we should work with all these working groups, but one that's left out despite seeming being, seemingly being exactly what you want, is privacy pass. 
Is is there a reason why 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 privacy policy is excluded? Uh, Brent Zendel, I'll answer this. Um, just because we forgot. <laughs> Good answer. Okay, that, that, fair enough. Uh, uh, Manu. Yeah, Manu Fontaine with Hashmesh. Um, fantastic uh, introduction, uh, focus on privacy, very, very important, obviously. Um, wanted to bring up the, uh, the work that we've been doing for a few years and the work that we are trying to bring to the ATF um, using confidential computing uh, to, you know, as, as you guys know, confidential computing enables verifiable software on verifiable hardware infrastructure. And so what we have stumbled into is the fact that we can actually develop software agents that are personal and that can be cryptographically bound to individual entities. If you introduce the concept of a confidential privacy preserving personal software agent acting on behalf of an entity, the problem space collapses because you can have agents that talk to one another, do the presentation, the verification, the exchange of data in a way that is in fact completely in, invisible to humans. Um, so you keep that in a information space that is completely shielded, protected, encrypted away from humans. So um, very interested in participating in this group and basically bring you know, that new infrastructure layer underneath this work. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Manu. Yeah, I think you raised an important point because uh, some of you who have been working in this space a little longer know that these efforts have been tried before, but now I think we have technology in our hands uh, that enables some of those use cases like these wallets with some of these trusted execution environments and other hardware technologies that allow us to store these credentials more securely and, and so on and so on, attestation and all this other good stuff. So, yeah, so we are in a much better position today than we were, let's say, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, Bob. Bob Moskowitz. Um, I've been dragged kicking and screaming, screaming into the molasses of aviation. The International Civil Aviation Organization, which is an agency of the UN, but has its own treaty from 1946. And talk about politics. Anyway, um, they have taken 10 plus years to get to their um, um, certificate policy and get to their testing. Oh, by the way, they run the root CA for digital passports. I've talked to the people there who, who run that root CA that every nation state can then um, get signed for. If, you, if, you, if your nation state has digital passports, it's because of the work done under the auspices of the UN through IKO for digital passports. So um, if you talk about how passports get into this, you're gonna be talking X509. If you're talking about how um, mechanics are certifying planes, it's going to be X509. If you're talking about the avi avionics on planes and the rest of it, it's X509. I can go on and on. It's taken them, like I said, 10 years, and the, uh, the, the, the uh, craft is moving. So all this discussion, the rest of it, I have to see how to, how to meld all this together because how the new stuff is going to go in and they work on a well five years from now we'll get around to it because what it takes for instance to change a fleet of planes it's a three-year maintenance cycle so we're talking about to to roll the root um, certificate on a fleet of planes that process takes plan on five years so these are the sorts of things which I'm dealing with, and I just found out. Um, thank you, Hank. You said got me yesterday and said I better be here, and and I'm here, and I will work on because I know the many people who are working on this and see about them getting involved because um, they have a lot. As I, met, as I mentioned in my email, you should see the stack of paper that many of these planes have stuffed away in a special cabinet of all the certification processing. If a plane gets maintenance work in some parts of the other world, they have to be the specially un um, passenger flown to another part of the world to be recertified. It's a mess. 
<laughs> and and we can kind of take that as some some examples and other things of how to do this stuff. Sounds like it would be a good input to the discussion around the architecture, Bob. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Cedric. Hi, thanks. So I'm Cedric Fournet. I have a question about the scope, in particular, the uh, decision to separate the credentials from the protocols on them. Uh, in particular, it seems that for some of the privacy properties, the two will need to be mixed uh, uh, quite uh, intricately. So for, as an example, you can have a presentation where you do a interactive proof of disclosure so that you can convince the verifier, but the verifier can't convince someone else or you can do a, a disclosure of a presentation disclosure that enables the verifier to, to, to store it and to convince someone else that the presentation happened. And so I'm wondering how to articulate this uh, flexibility in terms of privacy with the separation between uh, credentials and uh, protocols. But, but go for it, please. Yeah. Um, I think a straightforward answer is, hi, it's Christina. Um, there are no clear winner on the credential formats. So we really want to separate the protocol layer from the credential format layer. The protocols that have seen the adoption tends to be agnostic to the actual credential format, what it transports. And there's a lot of work like being done in OpenID Foundation, building the protocol for the credentials for natural persons in uh, building up on OWASP and OpenID Connect, 10 plus years of experience. Um, for legal persons, I think there are architectures emerging, leveraging that, like OWASP, oh, OpenID Connect, OpenID for private credentials work. And for supply chains, machine identity, I think there are you know, new work like VIMC or um, SCIT emerging in ITF as well. So we really do not want to recreate that work in this new working group. OK. Um, Shigeya. Hi, Shigeya Suzuki, KO Wide. Um, Thank you very much for the summary. summary. And uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, uh, discovery of the issues. And uh, I'm wondering why the item mentioned by Christina is missing from this start on the set. So you are wondering why that the discovery part uh, is missing from this milestone list? Uh, yeah, this this, this is, yeah. I um, I would say like and I let others uh, speak on that as well. Um, that would be covered under this uh, nebulous term identity documents. Yeah, I think so. It just should be probably a bit clear. It covers discovery, key resolution, identification, yeah. authentication. But yeah. that's a point. Yeah. Yeah, we had to somehow sort of keep it short in the milestone list. Uh, but from the from a charter like uh, description, sort of. This is covered under that part, so we didn't we didn't forget that. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Ori. Hi, Ori Steele, a natural person. Um, to the point on privacy pass, um, one of the things I think that really as I prepared slides regarding, you know, unlinkability, as I start to consider how IETF has, has tackled this particular challenge, um, privacy pass really was missing from, from a lot of the discussion, especially within the OAuth uh, framing around unlinkability. And as I compare the description of unlinkability within OAuth documents to the descriptions of unlinkability as a property within privacy pass, um, I find really good pieces in both, but sometimes really strong alignment and sometimes uh, different pieces. And in the context of, uh, especially, um, as I said, non-natural person identity, bot identity, machine identity, some of these unlinkability characteristics that Privacy Pass has been sort of looking at are really, really interesting. Um, 
So, uh, Jonathan, it's 100%, you know, our, my mission, our mission from not including privacy pass in here, I think there's a lot to learn from that work. Thanks, Ari. Yeah, we definitely have to, like, not only this part of the charter, but of course, there will be other parts based on feedback that has to be updated. Uh, Roman. Hi, Roman Danilio back at the mic. Uh, I'll speak as an individual. So, I, I, from, from, the, from the presentations and the charter text, I'm a little confused as to the way ahead and, and what we want to work on. I think the milestones around selective disclosure with CWT and the unlinkability was kind of motivated. We had some kind of good examples. I think I understand what that deliverable kind of looks like. We're talking about a fundamental kind of building block. I'm less, I understand the rest of it less. So I, I still don't know what is the identity work that we're doing. So back to the idea with the, the CWT stuff, right. I mean, we have flexibility. We're providing for a container that can be used for a lot of different things. As I read the charter text, I actually heard we're not, there's a specific section that says we're not doing print of protocol work. So I was confused as to like the key discovery piece that felt like protocol work that, so we, we tee it up, but it doesn't appear to be in scope and explicit say it's out of scope. I was also confused as to the checkout criteria we're going to have that we know, in a sense, we're done. I heard motivating use cases around individual identities. There are some things that said they were out of scope. I heard things around supply chain stuff that we also said is out of scope. And it doesn't even seem unpa unpacked at all in what is, uh, in a sense, identity documents. And then we create design criteria that I don't know how we achieve. Like, I don't know what the measure of a semantic interchangeability is or how we'll measure usability, feasibility, which we put as first order design principles with kind of security properties. So I get the idea of basic building blocks for CWT, the identity piece I'm still really struggling with. Okay. Can I go uh, live, uh, give it a show. So maybe the term protocol is the thing that gets us into, into trouble here. I think protocol, there are many aspects of the term protocol that would apply to this, right? Um, but when Christina mentioned protocols are out of scope, I, somebody said protocols are out of scope. I think that the, 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 the intention there is to say transport protocols are out of scope. The way we get from A to B, from issuers to wallets, from wallets to, to verifiers, that bit is out of scope because that is A, getting done elsewhere, B, there are lots of these, around, well, not a lot, not lots, but there are some of these around, right? And they all kind of want to use the same um, mechanisms, underlying mechanisms for representing credentials, right? So there is a commonality, there's a set of common foundational um, components, some of which, yes, have the protocol smell to them. But you know, I, maybe if we use the term um, credential transport uh, is out of scope, it would be clearer. I, I think certainly we need to respond, you know, some editorial work around that, because when I read transport protocol of OAuth, I mean, OAuth clearly, or W3C, I mean, those are not transport protocols as we would traditionally kind of think. I mean, this is application stuff. Yeah. And also, um, like you, when you mentioned privacy pass, privacy pass is to, of course, an architecture as well as cryptographic mechanism, as well as protocols for actually getting the token and then using the token. So, um, uh, Daniel. Uh, hello. Uh, so I, I would agree that uh, something about the transport protocols may actually have an impact on the properties that we care about. Uh, some transport protocols themselves have linkability uh, issues. So to say that they're completely out of scope seems a little bit odd. Uh, I just wanted to highlight for folks, um, there's discussion in the chat around what do people do who don't actually have devices? If we're talking about these things being deployed, uh, uh, at scale uh, for things that people need to get around in society. Not everyone has a device. Um, even people who do have devices, not everyone wants to carry them all the time. And sometimes, this may shock people in the room, but sometimes you run out of batteries. And so I really appreciate that the um, design principles, the availability calls out specifically the offline slash paper credential use cases. And I wanna highlight that it is actually very challenging to think about um, some of these things that we want, selective disclosure and unlinkability, with, um, uh, with those offline or paper use cases. Um, and so I do hope that the working group will consider those cases as well and think about what, what it means to do it without a device. Hmm. 
I just want to say yes to that. You said yes, we need to consider it, or a yes to what? I agree with uh, DK, DKJ. That, those are important aspects, and I'm sure uh, they will arise naturally. To some extent, like we're proposing, a f yes, the, these are a set of very um, specific milestones, right? Hmm. Um, but I, I think everybody understands that if this working group spins up, it will attract, there are like lots of problems in this space, right? That can, that needs a place for people to work on it. That's why Hank's or uh, Kalia's summary of the, the purpose of the working group is so great, right? It's a venue for working on credential stuff, verifiable credential stuff in the uh, ITF. Um, I have an answer too, which is folks are working on cl cloud-based wallets so that people don't have to have devices. Happy to talk offline about where that's happening. So that was uh, Kalia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dennis, you and the queue, you're remote, I guess. Yes, yeah, thank you. I am Denis Panka. I'm remote from France. Well, I've participated to the SPICE uh, both uh, discussion. And uh, from my point of view, a framework document is needed, not an architecture document, because multiple architecture are able to provide solutions. Selective disclosure is only one kind of many other zero knowledge proof. You can compute predicates, you can prove that you are a member of a group or a non member of a group. And this should be part of the framework, even if we don't address that case immediately. Uh, also, I would like to insist that it is necessary to support protocols in addition to data structures. Unfortunately, protocols are not in the scope currently. Now, saying that JOT or a CBOR uh, web token should be used to support is premature. As an example, a JOT mandates that the claim should also only be present once, where our sum attribute should be able to be present multiple times to facilitate selector disclosure. For example, age over 18, age over 15, or nationality equal US, or nationality equal CA. That's the kind of claims that should be duplicated, and this avoid very difficult uh, other schemes to be present. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dennis. And Justin, are you here and respond to Dennis's? I'm in the queue. Oh, okay. Uh, um, so then I'll give it a try. Uh, so the, uh, Dennis, you raised a couple of points. One was on the architecture front, uh, which, is, which is a tricky one. Uh, so my understanding of an architecture document is that it contains um, the terminology uh, and also the different roles that participate in, in the information flow. And those, there are many different instantiations of that architecture. So it, there may not be just one way to deploy things uh, or, or instantiate with protocols that are being worked on. So it's kind of, I, I see it as a way to describe the different um, design aspects. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be as religious about the terms used, architecture versus framework, and, and it's one version only. So I would be um, quite flexible. And there are some good architecture documents in the, in the IDF to look at and to basically model such a document uh, accordingly. Okay, Justin. Yeah, so uh, first I got in the queue to actually raise a uh, question about the use of uh, protocols being out of scope. I think we're actually making progress towards being clear about what we mean by what kinds of protocols we would want to be out of scope. Um, the second bit uh, is kind of related, and that is what is the plan for all of the things that this uh, group should it form deems are out of scope. Uh, there, this touches a lot of different areas, as we saw in the in the early thing. That's a lot of different places to dispatch to and liaise with. Uh, so what is the plan for uh, sort of keeping and growing those connections so that the work does go to the right place and this doesn't end up being, oh, it says VC, so it goes in spice type of place? Yeah, I, 
I, I don't have a clear kind of answer, but I think that's something we're going to have to put in the charter to, mm -hmm. to very crisply describe. I mean, there's a lot of use cases that we're talking about kind of informing it, but we got to decide which ones we're going to need and check out or we will not be able to charter. One yeah. thing that I personally saw working really well is to actually have uh, participants from these other organizations uh, discuss with us in the working group uh, because that simplifies the information flow. If we start to have liaisons through the IB and all these sorts of things, it gets pretty complicated. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer for that either, but I think that that is something that this group absolutely needs to uh, have a process for as part of this. I, I, again, I think we would use that as chart and criteria with my AD hat on. It would be exceedingly difficult to say we are building something for insert vertical and we would not have that vertical participation and we wouldn't hear them from the floor saying, I want this, I need this. All right, thank you. Thank, thanks, Justin. Uh, Oliver. Yeah, as one of the SD chart VC authors and assuming there will be a significant overlap between SPICE and, and all of experts, I could imagine that the work on SD chart VC is happening in SPICE at some point. But it should uh, definitely be closely aligned to begin with. Um, I, I guess we'll have some discussions on that later. Um, so the reason is that I see a lot of conceptual overlap between you mentioned uh, CWT identity documents and the SD chart you see work, which was already adopted by the OAuth working group after IETF San Francisco. Um, for instance, uh, SD chart is defines an SD chart based identity document format. It also contains a way to do issue discovery and validation using different technologies uh, such as DITS, uh, X509, uh, chart issue metadata. It would be good to align as much as possible. Um, I don't agree that presentation and insurance protocol should not be a priority, it shouldn't be a priority as they are doing um, protocols in other organizations. I guess uh, it was also what uh, Christina mentioned earlier. But I think that some protocols in scope, um, such as the issue of key discovery thing. Um, but in general, I'm supportive of having a working group for VC stuff in IT. Uh, thanks, sorry, but um, is there some quick feedback from someone? Okay, uh, no, uh, but, but thanks for the support, Oliver. And, and I, like, as I said on the list, uh, definitely, and it's, as it was just uh, reiterated also from Justin, obviously there's a, there's a need to closely collaborate between sort of like uh, this group and the OAS working group. Of course, there's a significant overlap, but uh, making sure that the semantics are aligned, even if the actual serialization and encoding uh, differs, of course, between JSON and, and uh, CBOR, but I think uh, that, that will be uh, will be key because uh, it will simplify the understanding as Ori put it for the developer if they have see the same terminology, same semantics. Uh, so that would be a big plus. Okay, Nick. Nick Doty, Center for Democracy and Technology. There has been some discussion of, of privacy, although I must say it's concerning if we've um, just just forgotten about some other groups that work on privacy. Um, it, it's good that we're considering things like selective disclosure and, and unlikability. Certainly the privacy properties could be even worse without those things. Um, but I, 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 I am scared that, that maybe we're only thinking about those privacy properties. Um, the, the presenter earlier asked if, if there were any others. Um, as, as certainly we could come up with many more. Uh, some things we might want to consider are things like transparency, uh, control, accountability. Um, do, do, we, do we ever think there might be cases where this technology is misused and what mitigations will we have for that? If, if this group wants to consider that, if, if the ITF wants to have a group that, that will fully consider those topics, um, uh, I, I would be open to it, um, but I, I am concerned about facilitating a, a papers please internet where you have to present uh, your 
government credentials in order to use any internet services. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm not sure I see the justification here beyond, well, other groups are talking about it, so ITF should have a group for it too. Um, I, if the ITF wants to have a working group here, I would rather have us have some guarantee that we are not facilitating uh, the, this papers please internet uh, and, and not just, well, there's, there's an EU law and, and we better do something. Um, th thanks, Nick. Um, in all fairness, I gave Mike 10 minutes uh, to speak about privacy. Uh, of course, that didn't uh, do it fully justice. Uh, it's a broad topic. Um, I, hope, I hope you would be willing to participate to provide us actually the, the, the full glance of it. And, and having worked with CDT I, uh, myself, I, I think you guys could provide a lot of uh, good input into that debate. But uh, Christina, are you in also in response to Nick? No. No. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, please bring these additional consideration into a, into the discussion, Nick. Sorry, Ori wanted to respond. Oh, Ori, you wanted to respond? Okay. Hey, uh, Ori Steele. So, um, as I mentioned, thank you. As I mentioned before. Um, I work on uh, transparency services for software uh, use cases. One of the things that I find really, really interesting is this um, sort of uh, duality between transparency and unlinkability. There are lots of cases where you want transparency with correlation, and there's lots of cases where you might want to build unlinkability without transparency or unlinkability, but with a special kind of transparency. So to the, to the point about, you know, have we thought about all the ways that unlinkability and selective disclosure can work? I don't think we have, but one of the er areas I'm really excited about is the overlap between transparency services, zero knowledge proofs, and unlinkability. And that's definitely work that uh, you know I've been working on in various different groups. And I think having a place where we can talk about the risks associated with that deployment, uh, the, the, those kinds of deployment considerations, the design principles that go into those formats. Um, Nick, especially your comment on the sort of papers, please, uh, component. I, that is a thing I'm very concerned about here. We're all technologists. We love the technology. To be cautious about, you know, a world where this was rolled out everywhere. I also think um, that's a place where the IAB and other IETF uh, sort of organs are probably better positioned to help us engage with the communities um, that can best address those kinds of concerns. So uh, basically plus one to many of your comments. Well, plus two then, uh, and Nick, I'd love to talk with you. I, I've, I've missed the name, but so Manu with Hashmesh, I want to again suggest that uh, we think in terms of introducing a confidential personal agent in the mix, because the minute you do that, you can actually have a verifiable piece of software that can attest to what it's doing, which gives the transparency, the provenance, the accountability, the anonymity when needed. Uh, there's all kinds of issues that get resolved and, and the problems space collapses. So we should very much look into that uh, instead of uh, focusing on short term, you know, formats and things like that. Although I do agree with the COSI and the CBOR type approach to things, but there's, there's another layer underneath all this. Christina. Um, this is way too high. Um, yeah, I wanted to give a stab at what Justin mentioned, what is out of scope. Um, and I also, just for the context, I work on this for fiber credential stuff across ISO, ITF, W3C, Opnity Foundation, DIF, whatnot. So I would claim to have some kind of understanding where the gaps are. Um, I think one thing, so nothing linked data, RDF is in scope. That's absolutely out of scope. Another thing is it has to be defined probably better, but focus on this three-party model. Um, I guess definition could be a synchronous issuance and presentation. Um, and also, I would like to kind of give a better stab, I think, Leif did a good job clarifying, but giving a stab at differentiating transport protocols from credential formats. So when we say credential formats, I think we mean this a piece of a data model, like a piece of data that issuer is attesting about 
an entity that so it includes definition of a data model maybe a schema and how that thing is is signed right and how the keys to verify that are discovered is not always in scope so i think that's why we kind of you know present earlier presentation today we're kind of trying to separate those two and transfer protocol is more about who i am who's requesting you know the messages i'm what are the requirements for things that fulfill the request? How am I returning it? What not, including query languages. And again, the transport product, defining a new transport protocol should be out of scope. I am pretty strong on this, but I'm um, hearing some comments. Yeah, if we're gonna work on architecture document or something, like referring to them or maybe you know, clarifying the requirements and privacy, what not, for those transfer protocols could be mentioned. Um, I, I don't know, but I think that's kind of, so if you flip that back, I think anything that fulfills a requirement of state party model, credential format, or identifier key discovery documents um, is kind of in scope. Um, and also back to quickly to the next point, um, getting this three party model is very hard. Getting it right is very hard. Like we've been working on this, like building it for like six years and you know, like it, it's, it's not going to be perfect in the next few years. Like I, I personally think, but we should be careful in differentiating how much technology can do to from like privacy, sec privacy, security, um, what was it, accountability perspectives, because a lot of it is regulations and like requirements from, from that, right? Um, and being as much as, again, like I don't want to sound controversial, but as much as privacy is really important, if we will wait for, you know, like ZKP, the most, the best ZKP algorithms to be ready to deploy the scale, like this will never come to life. So I would encourage all of us to, while obviously caring about those aspects, to be really careful about the balance and balance between, you know, their deployment, but also the balance between on um, what technology can actually do. Leif. All right. So I, I actually came in, up here to make another point, um, but I'll start with just briefly addressing Nick's um, concern about papers, please, internet. And I, I, I've been working in digital identity for what, almost 20 years, and I've never, ever felt that I was getting in danger of having technologies that were so simple that they were getting over deployed, right? We're not, <laughs> we're not, we're, we're not anywhere close to that, right? The, the things that we're trying to build in the UDI wallet space are like to add a little bit of automation to processes that are like stupidly manual today, like simple things like being able to show that you're a, you have license to practice nursing in a different country right? are still fraught with manual processes today, right? And those are the things we're trying to address. And to your, and that's the point I came up to make, to, to your point, Roman, the verticals that are represented, and it will be represented if this group gets shorted through the involvement of the large gay pilots, involve things like um, university educational credentials, uh, educational credentials from other, um, well, other areas of education, K, K through 12, for instance. Those will actually be uh, represented in the working group. Um, uh, labor market, social security, are specific use cases in play in the large scale pilots in the EU and the people who will be involved in the working group will directly represent sort of the needs of those verticals. So Leif, I'm gonna kind of jump in here. If I could help me construct this sentence, is the IETF creating building blocks so others can create the nursing license representation or is yeah. the IETF creating no, the, the, the representation the for the, the license. The building blocks, right? The found, that's, that's exactly my point in the, the, the ITF ask slide that I had, right? We're, we need some foundational components, standards components, that we can use to build an ecosystem in, in my specific case, right, for the EU digital wallet, right? And in such a way that it becomes uh, globally interoperable, privacy preserving, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, Giovanni. Hello, Giovanni Federicheski from Inria. Uh, I just want, I work in the Lake Working Group that is lightweight authentication uh, key, key exchange. And I just wanted to state that uh, for, for my part, there is an interest in identity documents that are very concise. So using CWT, that I think that makes a lot of sense. In the past, I have tried to kind of convert uh, DID documents to to CBOR and this stuff. So yeah, maybe you can chat about that later. Thanks, and thanks for that practical experience. Um, Dan, you are the last one. Hi, thanks. So uh, I really appreciated Nick's point about uh, needing to think about accountability uh, in the system that we design here. Uh, and I wanna push back a little bit on the idea that we need to depend uh, on the um, regulatory regime for uh, privacy controls. So I think that's true, uh, but I think that the regulatory regimes can only make use uh, of the mechanisms that are available to them. And if we design a presentation protocol um, that does not have hooks for accountability, then the regulators don't have much to work with. So we have an obligation as we work here to design systems that provide opportunities for accountability Specifically, my concern is that the, the folks who have the least power in the system are likely to be the holders. And so we need to make sure that these systems that we design have accountability for the verifiers and accountability for the issuers. We learned this the hard way um, with certificate transparency. Um, and it, we have some lessons we can apply maybe there. Uh, that's accountability for the issuers. I don't know how we can apply accountability to the verifiers, but I hope that the smart people in this room will work on that. I just made a pull request for the charter to add accountability to the design considerations uh, in the charter. Yeah, it's a good, good point. Uh, yeah, uh, go for it. Uh, Brent Sundell, just responding to that and the other concerns about privacy that have been raised. Um, the reason I'm involved with this work, the reason Ori's involved with this work, the reason Christina's involved with this work isn't because we want to create these magical building blocks to do awesome things with no regard for usability, privacy, and, and the humans that will be involved. The reason that we are here is because we do have those same concerns and we want to do it right. And we, we welcome that input. We welcome that feedback. We, we are not forging ahead blindly. We are treading very cautiously and trying to do things in the right way. Um, so just wanted to... Yeah, nicely said, Brent. Cool. Okay. Um, so now, um, having about only 20 minutes left, we need to come to the important questions, sort of like uh, involving the rest of the room here, um, finding out like where do we go from, from here. So we've gotten a, uh, some feedback on, on the charter text. Obviously, it's not uh, there yet, so we need to make updates and, and uh, provide that feedback in. I heard uh, we need clarifications regarding the protocols, uh, fine tune the, the language around uh, privacy and so on. Um, having said that, we can, I think we can still give uh, the ISG a recommendation on like what the vibe of the room is, whether they think this is actually kind of going in the right direction or whether this is a, a total no-go. Um, let me switch over to, or do we actually have the buff questions? Here they are. Okay, cool. Um, how do we best do that? Um, Yeah. Okay. Um, let's focus on the first question here. So, so you've seen a couple of presentations um, on on the content. You have also seen the milestones. Um, you, you hopefully uh, see that there is a problem worth solving. So. We would like to get uh, a sense of the room of whether you think that there is a, a problem worth solving. Yeah, so 
you hum if you think there is, and you, and then we no, ask the opposite no, question. We were going to poll, but we can't hum because we got to get the remote. Oh, so, the yeah. remote. Uh, so we got to use the poll. Oh, show we the use the poll. Oh, damn it! Uh, how does that work? I don't have enough permissions to do that. Okay, how do show me? I can do it. I know how to do it. Just tell me what you want it to be. What's the proposal? Yeah. Uh, um, is this is this uh, we need to ask the, the the use the poll tool to ask the question of whether this is uh, worth a problem worth solving? Is this a problem worth solving? The first bullet point essentially. That's the second well, the, the first bullet point before the is the ITF the right group? <laughs> oh, okay, that was fast. Uh, Yeah, we have lots of remote participants, so uh, it's obviously good to to also ask them and, and not create a huge amount of chaos. It pops up if you log in. You have to be logged into the media. You have to be logged into the Media Echo app. We'll let, that, we'll let that run for a little bit to see some people are still uh, trying to log in. Can I say that uh, I would have preferred if we asked the third question, as in, do we have good definition of what the problem is before we ask if it's worth solving? Well, you, you should have from the presentation and from the chart. Uh, you... I mean, it's a question there, right? So you're asking me to say, hey, this is worth solving before if I've agreed that this is a valuable question. Or, or I understand the question, or the you know what what's being proposed is. Can we, we, uh, we can do that. We can ask that too. Like it would be interesting. It's probably a, a consistency check. Uh, <laughs> so if if you all think in question one whether this, this is worth solving, and then later say you actually don't understand what's being solved, then then we, there's an issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess you. You've all done your, your job, so I'll terminate that one here. So in summary, um, so the feedback I got out of the, all the participants is a, a clear yes, 85 uh, people said yes, there is a problem worth solving here, and only five people said no, there isn't, uh, which like is crystal clear. Yeah, is there uh, someone uh, out of those five people who would be willing to speak up and say like why they think that this is not the case. I don't want to put you on the spot, but no, no, Nick. okay, Nick. <laughs> Nick is willing to be on the spot. Okay. Nick, Nick Dody, Center for Democracy and Technology. I, I, I don't know what problem the group intends to solve. I, I agree that there are many problems worth solving. I, I, I cannot say yes. <laughs> this is a problem that, that needs solving until I know what the group is trying to do. So let's check the script. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, no, we got someone else at the mic. Uh, Brent. Brent Zundel pointing out, it says, there is a problem that needs solving. Not this is a problem that needs solving. There's a problem. We need to solve it. The IETF is the right place to solve it. That's the question. Yeah. Whether what, like specifically what the, no? Is that not what the words say? Yeah. That's not yeah. what the poll said. Yeah, but that uh, is this. Yeah. OK. Um, let's go to the, to the next one, the next part. Um, if you um, specifically for those who just voted yes, uh, is the IETF the right place to actually do this type of work? The work that was. We got to pull that. Yeah. Uh, bam, you need to. Can you, is the IETF the right group? I'm on it. Okay. Yeah, hacking it. I'm still going to refer to it as this problem, if that works. <laughs> Might as well be consistent. Yeah.
Okay, letting it run for a few more seconds and Okay, I'll stop that here. Just doing it a show of hands. Yeah, um, so what I got here is that uh, like um, 69 participants said, yes, the IDF is the right uh, group to do this work. The uh, four people said no, um, obviously would be interested to hear uh, if anyone wants to come to the mic to say something about that. And there are, there are lots of people, 84, who say they have no opinion um, for whatever reason. Um, Mallory, you jumped into the queue. Please speak up. Uh, Mallory Nodal, Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, so I'll out myself as a no, only because I it's it's more it, it's less clear that it's a yes. And my specific reasons for that are we've talked a bit about work that's happening in other standards bodies, mm -hmm. uh, W3C and so on. And additionally, um, again, there's just ambiguity about specifically what this these problems are that are here that are separate and then combining those two concerns i think that we there is some verging on forum shopping a bit where things haven't taken off as well in other um standards bodies and so i'm i'm just worried about that so i'm just mm -hmm. putting myself out there as having enough concern that i couldn't say yes okay uh, yeah that's that's good feedback uh Rifa. Yeah. It, it seems to me that you probably want to go to bullet three first because it seems that lots of people are not voicing a, an opinion because that is still not clear, right? Okay, yeah, uh, thanks, Riva. Um I still want to like go back to what is being proposed in terms of the, the written uh, sort of statement. And those are um, the items that are being propose to sort of address this this uh, larger problem state uh, space, namely these uh, selective disclosures with CWDs uh, as a counterpart to what we have in uh, for JSON web tokens. Um, likewise, uh, the unlinkability version of those, and then these identity discovery or uh, in identity presentation documents that uh, are summarized as identity documents with CWDs. So just as a, as a reminder, but point taken. Um, so that's good. Uh, let's ask the um, this the question. Oh, there's the scope question. No. Yeah. No. Um, so is the scope of the problem well understood, well defined and understood? Pam, um, can you ask? Then can you type in that question? Okay. Okay, let I let it run for a little bit longer. Okay, okay. Stop it here. So uh, that's an interesting one. Um, so I have 24 yes, uh, 57 no, and uh, 74 with no opinion. So that's a little bit um, in contradiction with what we had initially. Um, so it sounds like the problem statement is not as crisp as we would be hoping for. Um, what do we take? make out of this. There are a few, uh, there's one person who wants to go to the mic. Uh, Gillen? Okay, uh, I'm Gillen from Singapore, Power International. 
So I just have a comment. Maybe the chair can remind the participants, especially remote ones, yeah, how to vote. Yeah, maybe someone maybe quite new don't know. Okay, how how I can how they can vote. Yeah, some may don't know. Okay, yeah. so you you are not familiar yeah. with the tools that we are using. Yeah, some, okay, yeah, some that's that's fair. Um, yeah, it's uh. So if you if you uh, there is some material uh, available, but uh, the short version is scan a QR code, log into the device, and then you see the pop up and you click the button. That's the, the super short version. Uh, Carsten. Yeah, my problem really is that I couldn't answer yes to the question as it is phrased on the slide, because the problem is huge. And we are not trying to bite off the whole thing in one step. I do understand what we want to bite off mm -hmm. very well. I'm not sure I understand the full scope of the problem, but I, it would be really weird if I did that. You're a professor, you, you know? <laughs> you know, if you don't understand it, like we are really toast. <laughs> Clarify this. A professor can talk about things they don't understand. <laughs> uh, real quick to answer uh, to Gillen's uh, earlier question about how to vote. If you're on mobile, sometimes you have to refresh the page when the poll pops up. It doesn't automatically pop up. So I came up with it. Uh, I came across that. Uh, Dave. Yeah, uh, there's been a lot of discussion today about the milestones, and you've gone back to those repeatedly. And I think it was even admitted earlier that the milestones are kind of written in a fairly abstract way. I think a lot of the confusion around the scope is that we didn't do a very deep review of the charter and um, you know discussion around that. And I think if we would have done more of that, you might be in a different place at this point in the conversation. Well, there's also uh, a little bit of responsibility to for the participants who show up uh, to look through the text because it's not a uh, like a readout of the of the charter text. Sure, that was just um, my observation. But uh, um, at least for me, uh, the milestones always like indicate quite clearly on like what does the group initially want to work on. And there are some documents available for those, uh, like the, the SD chart for CWD. That document is out there, so you can look at it. The, the unlinkability stuff for the JSON work is also available. So that also should give you an, a good idea on like where this is heading to. Um, but um, point taken. Uh, I see. Uh, Manu, you're next. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to explain my vote. I said yes, yes, no. Um, I think it, there's definitely a problem that can be tackled now. Uh, like you said, um, technology has evolved a lot. We have solution, a, a, a solution kit, a, a set of solutions that can be applied to the general problem of privacy, trust, accountability, and all that good stuff. Uh, it's definitely the place for the ATF to solve this problem because this is an internet layer uh, issue, not a, a web layer issue. And the no is, is I think there's a, uh, a something infrastructural that comes underneath the definition of the milestones that needs to be addressed first. So, okay. so I want to use the last five minutes to just um, figure out on what we do next. Uh, My life. Hi everyone. I'm going to put on my ISG hat. You know, given that this was uh, was presented as a working group forming BOF, uh, here's roughly what I heard. So first, we have a we have a very big kind of turnout here, which is kind of fabulous, and I thank everyone, uh, both in the room and remote, for a very professional and, and constructive uh, conversation. One of the one of the things uh, I was listening for in this BOF because I saw it a lot on the mailing list was is there a distinction between what we're going to be talking about here with some of the other things in flight in other working groups specifically some of the conversations that we started in, in OAuth. We didn't explicitly poll for that question, but I at least got a weak signal in this room that 
I, I didn't hear at the mic line a number of times, no Roman, like we can already do this in existing working groups. I felt like we were talking about something, you know, emergent, something kind of newer that we needed to manage and kind of think about differently in a working group. So if folks can kind of, I, we're not gonna have enough time, but if folks disagree with that, please bring that to the mail list. So that, that was a trend I, I, I was looking for, but we didn't specifically ask for. Uh, based on the conversation and based on, on the engagement, I, I hear that there is interest absolutely working on verifiable credentials. And I also heard that there's more work to do on CWTs that's, that, that's running kind of in parallel to other work we're doing with, with, J, with JWTs. So there's kind of something there. I'm hand waving a little bit because that's kind of a little bit of my, my next point. I think we also have kind of feedback with the confusion with the polls. Is the problem clear? Is it kind of not clear? The mismatch between the scope and the problem is back to this idea of we, there's interest kind of in the area, but we're still in a sense circulating both, it sounded like in the in the heads of the participants and in the charter text, do they kind of line up? Are we all thinking the same thing? And we have, have we crisply written it up to describe what, what is that? I don't think we have that. Uh, so I think the next step typically in a situation we have is this is actually a positive result. So we have a, we have a signal that there's interest to kind of work on that problem, but we have to refine it more. So between now and some kind of future date, what we'll do is we'll come back to the mailing list. We have a starting piece of charter text. We should probably refine that, get more feedback on it. I did not see a diverse set of feedback on that charter text on the mailing list. We should, we should absolutely bring that to the mailing list. And depending on kind of where we are, this may trigger a boff of a future boff of kind of some kind, or it may turn out organically. Everyone comes together on the mailing list and we are comfortable kind of with that text. That is also a possible result. But you know, all the paths I, I see here uh, are we got to continue to kind of refine what exactly we mean and what exactly we need to work on. But big picture, there appears to be interest to work on something in this space. Thanks a lot for coming. And Thanks. And also thanks to my my co-chair Pam. Uh, she wasn't able to come to the to the meeting in person, uh, but she obviously worked uh, with me behind the scenes to get this all organized and and uh, put this thing together. Thank you. Reminder, we're on the hot mic. Yeah. yeah.